Today we have former federal prosecutor and the host of Justice Matters, Glenn Kirshner. Thanks for coming back on. Hey, my pleasure, Brian. So you've spoken about this on your YouTube channel. Why do you believe that the DOJ is finally criminally investigating Trump? So I have an opinion on that. And, you know, opinions are like elbows. Everybody's got a couple and they're often no use to anybody else. But I'm going to take a stab at it. So first of all, I think DOJ has been doing a lot behind the scenes that we don't know about, which is ordinarily the way things should play out. DOJ doesn't run to the mic and announce what crimes it's investigating, who their targets are. Um, however, you know, we've got the public hearings getting ready to kick off uh, June 9th. And I am as optimistic as I think I've been over the course of the past few years that this is going to be exactly what the American people need. And the reason I say that is because the chief investigative counsel for the January 6th select committee the gentleman named Tim Keefe, uh, a friend and former colleague of mine. We worked the same major RICO case together in the DC US Attorney's Office. And I sat and I watched Tim give his opening statement in the most consequential RICO case we ever brought in the courts of Washington, DC. And I got justice goosebumps. He is just that good at both criminally investigating a case and presenting a compelling message to the audience, whether it's a jury or the American people. He's assembled a team of former federal prosecutors, and that's why everything I see out of the J6 committee has the feel to me of a RICO investigation being conducted by prosecutors. So I am so optimistic. I am so looking forward to the public hearings kicking off. And now to more directly answer your question, it sure feels like all of a sudden we've had this avalanche of information tumbling into the public square about the Department of Justice criminally investigating Donald Trump. Most directly, we know that because Peter Navarro, important caveat, if he is to be credited, said he received the subpoena to appear before a criminal grand jury in DC. And among other things, the subpoena directed him to provide all evidence of his communications with Donald Trump. We now know, assuming that's true, that the grand jury is investigating Donald Trump. Um, and, but we've also had other indications. They're going, you know, they're investigating Rudy Giuliani and Janet Ellis and John Eastman for the sort of Trump involved fake elector scheme. So we know DOJ is now criminally investigating Trump and his associates. Why now? Well, I think because what we're going to begin to see on June 9 will, as Representative Raskin said, blow the roof off the House. And there will be, I'm convinced, a public clamor, an outcry. Why isn't the Department of Justice criminally going after the, the people that we are now seeing? There is ample evidence committed crimes against our democracy, and DOJ apparently is doing nothing about it. That kind of pressure bursts pipes. And I, I'm not going to say DOJ is playing catch up now. I do think they've kicked it into high gear going after the command structure of the insurrection, not just Donald Trump's foot soldiers that he said on the Capitol on January 6th. I think that may be one of the reasons all of this information is now tumbling into the public square. So I have a, a lot of questions on the J6 committee, but I want to stick with DOJ for a moment. What would the end result of a criminal investigation from the DOJ look like? Like, explain it to me as someone with no no law experience. What are the sure. steps as this plays out? And, and could this at some point end up with Trump sitting in a courtroom? Yes. So the steps are they will begin to aggressively subpoena lots and lots of witnesses. The challenge for them is determining who's a witness and who's a target of the investigation. So Mark Meadows, it seems, based on the reporting by CNN about the nearly 3,000 texts, many of them pretty dramatically incriminating and implicating all three branches of government being complicit in the insurrection. You know, this is, this is mind-blowing stuff. The Department of Justice will have to decide who do we want to go at as a witness and who do we want to go at as a target. So when we determine, let's just say hypothetically, Mark Meadows is a target of the investigation as part of Donald Trump's conspiracy, the, the Department of Justice will have to decide, well, is he so big a criminal fish that we want to prosecute him and we don't want to try to develop the information he has against or about the crime of others? Or is he somebody that we want to perhaps threaten with prosecution and you know get the information in what we call a proffer 
under a queen for a day letter, an immunity for a day letter, and then assess what we want to do with Mark Meadows. Um, so there are lots of tactical decisions that will go into the way DOJ will approach each and every individual. But what it will look like at the end of the day, Brian, I'm confident, is that there will be an indictment handed down under 18 United States Code Section 371. Shorthand, we call it a 371 conspiracy. That's a conspiracy to commit offenses against or defraud the United States of America. It's a very broad criminal statute. It's precisely one of the charges that was brought by Robert Mueller against the Russian Internet Research Agency for interfering in our free and fair elections, which is what Donald Trump and his criminal associates did as well. The reason I'm so confident that charge will be brought probably as the lead charge once we see the first big indictment handed down is because a federal judge in California, Judge David Carter, has already ruled that Donald Trump and John Eastman together committed the crime of an offense against the United States or an attempt to defraud the United States and committed a second federal felony, obstructing an official preceding the certification of Joe Biden's win. And importantly, and I'll stop running my mouth here, the stream of consciousness. Importantly, Judge Carter made his ruling after an evidentiary hearing in a case that was litigating whether John Eastman would have to give over some emails. And he made that ruling by a preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not, 51% of the evidence supported his conclusion that Donald Trump committed these crimes. And Brian, to indict somebody, you only need probable cause, far less than the 51% Judge Carter already found. So I am pretty confident, based even just on the public reporting, that is going to be the sort of lead charge in the big indictment once we see it. But isn't Judge Carter's uh, precedent only only binding insofar as somebody else, another judge, wants to support that that bind the bindingness of it? Like we we've seen so many judges kind of say that they respect precedent, only to then you know not care once it's their turn to to rule on something. Yeah, and I hope I don't sound like I'm contradicting myself, but Judge Carter's ruling is not precedent at all, binding or persuasive. There are different kinds of precedent. His is not precedent. His is a trial court conclusion after an evidentiary hearing. But here's why it's important. I would call it atmospheric precedent because he assessed evidence and he decided that evidence met an evidentiary burden by a preponderance of the evidence. That is arguably more powerful than precedent. That's a ruling based on evidence. Precedent means an appellate court has announced some proposition of law um, that will now apply in other courts under the control of that appellate court. This, I would argue, is more important than legal precedent because it's a factual finding. It doesn't bind people, but it informs people. Now, since this is a federal matter, if Trump ends up in a courtroom, is this the kind of thing that could ultimately be appealed to the Supreme Court? And, and, oh, absolutely. And, can, can and will be. And, and would any conflict of interest prevent something like that, given that he's appointed a third of the, a third of the bench? Although I strongly presume that the answer is no. Yeah, the, it depends on who you ask. I would say a conflict of interest should come into play if you have a Supreme Court justice who has a direct conflict. Now, let me hasten to add, you don't have a direct conflict just because a certain president appointed you. You do have a direct conflict if you're sitting as a Supreme Court justice and you're asking to decide issues regarding your wife's conduct, like whether her potentially incriminating texts should be released or hidden. Two, that's apples and oranges there. But of course, the Supreme Court has no code of ethics that binds them. So, you know, we're up to the goodwill of the Supreme Court justices to make that decision. But I would again hasten to add, Brian, I don't have a lot of um, confidence in the Supreme Court. They've showed themselves to be somewhat compromised. Their legitimacy is at an all time low. They're about to take, it looks like, women's constitutional privacy rights uh, away from them. And that's probably just for openers. I believe they'll move on to contraception and gay marriage and perhaps other constitutional rights that they'll try to claw back from the American people. Here is the only arena in which I'm confident on this, uh, regarding the Supreme Court's actions, it's when it comes to issues of self-preservation. Remember, they did not 
try to corruptly throw the 2020 election to Donald Trump. And they had every opportunity to review cases that they could have used to accomplish that end. But they said, oh, heck no. Remember, there was also recent Supreme Court litigation or the opportunity for them to weigh in on whether the incriminating information should be released by the National Archives to the J6 committee. And all but Clarence Thomas, who was conflicted, said, oh, heck no. What does that tell us? When it comes to the power of the Supreme Court and issues that could impact their power, like elevating a president to a dictator, they're not going to have it, not because they're good ethical moral jurists, but because it impacts their position and their power, because a Democrat has no need for a truly supreme Supreme Court. Now, is it possible that Trump could have issued himself a pocket pardon while he was still president and that that could come into effect if he's actually convicted of a crime? Brian, I'm not a betting man. My one dollar is my betting limit. I would bet a buck Donald Trump has a pocket pardon, as does Jared and Ivanka and Don Jr. and Rudy. Part of what informs that opinion is why would all of these people waltzed into the J6 committee, all of them having various degrees of uh, self-incriminating information, and none of them pleaded the fifth. It's because they have a pardon, I believe. That is bolstered by Kellyanne Conway. If her book is to be believed, if it's not alternative facts, she said Donald Trump ambled up to her at the end of his term and said, and I'm going to use his word, hey, honey, you want a pardon? This is what Kellyanne wrote in her book, and it's been reported by Ashley Parker from The Washington Post and others doing something of a book review. If he offered unsolicited a blanket pardon to Kellyanne Conway, who reported that she politely declined because she didn't think she'd committed any crimes, do you really think he didn't give pardons to his kids and his close criminal associates? Of course he did. Donald Trump is never one to pass up a good grift. Now, do you think that that could come into effect uh, in the event that he's convicted of a crime? Yeah, once not only convicted, but charged. Once any of these people, if they have pocket pardons, is charged with a crime, indicted for a crime, they will pull out that pocket pardon and say, you, you, can't, you can't convict me, you can't charge me. And that is when the Department of Justice will have to take the principled position that we will challenge corruptly delivered pardons, because there are these pardon purists out there who say, no, the president's pardon power is unconstrained because the Constitution doesn't put any constraints. That's pure nonsense. Um, there are constraints on every power announced or in, embodied in the Constitution. You can always check the power for abuse. So if Donald Trump set up a pardon kiosk at the front door of the White House and was selling pardons for a million bucks a pop, the, the courts will not sanction that. They will strike it down as unconstitutional and against public policy, in my opinion. So I do think, and I hope, frankly, so we can set this issue to rest once and for all, corruptly delivered pardons get challenged in court. What would the crime be for Trump? And what could the punishments range from? I'm assuming being barred from running for office is among them. Sure. It could be a seditious conspiracy. It could be inciting an insurrection. And if I, I have my big, ugly blue book of federal laws, the United States Code, out of arm's reach, it's sitting right over there on my desk, I'm not going to run over and get it. Um, I believe that inciting an insurrection does not include, as part of its authorized punishment, a ban from future public office, but I believe a seditious conspiracy does. But I'd have to check the code. Here's what I know, though, Brian. And we've already talked about conspiracy to commit offenses against and defraud the United States. That is a viable charge that should be brought um, in uh, obstructing an official proceeding. That's a viable charge that should be brought. But I think treason is in play. And stick with me for a minute because I'm not being hyperbolic. When you read the U.S. Code, treason is defined as whoever owing allegiance to the United States. And Donald Trump does because he took an allegiance oath to the United States. Whoever owing allegiance to the United States levies war against the United States is guilty of treason. What we know, based on the publicly reported evidence, is that not only did Donald Trump, in a very literal sense, launch the attack, because he lied to everybody. He told them, your vote was stolen. Go down to the Capitol, fight like hell, or you won't have a country anymore. They obeyed his commands. In fact, the insurrectionists 
being tried for their crimes are using that as a defense. I was only doing what my president told me to do. That's not a legal defense. It may be what we call a mitigator. It may impact what kind of a sentence a judge hands down someday, but it's not a legal defense. He, he incited and actually launched the attack. And then we know for more than three hours, people were streaming into the White House dining room where Donald Trump was watching the attack on TV, rewinding to the good parts. We don't have any evidence on what Donald Trump believed the good parts were. I would assume it's when his angry mob was giving a really good beat down to the Capitol Police officers who were being overrun. And everybody was going in there, including Ivanka, imploring him to call off the attack and he refused. And now what, what do we know most recently? One of Mark Meadows' aides said, and Meadows comes out of a meeting and says, Donald Trump, one, is angry that Mike Pence is being whisked to safety, and two, he said, maybe Mike Pence should be hanged. Brian, I will take that case in front of a D.C. jury or any jury and make the argument that Donald Trump levied war against the United States. He waged war for at least three hours, and he should be held accountable for treason, and that comes with a ban from future office. Now that's a good time to transition to the upcoming January 6th hearings. Are there really any facts about January 6th that aren't known? Like, is there anyone who doesn't remember Trump peppering his supporters with the big lie on a daily basis or him tweeting uh, for the wild crowd to come or his blatant connections with far-right militia groups uh, or John Eastman's three easy step guide on how to do a coup? Like what new information do you actually expect uh, to be uncovered here? And, and I imagine that's gonna, uh, play a pretty direct role in terms of people, what Americans more broadly take away from this. Yeah, uh, we know a lot, you know, in this day and age of instant reporting, you know, sometimes reporters are criticized as being little more than stenographers of current events. Not a, a lot of research and analysis goes into it sometimes, but we know a lot. Um, and my guess is we know probably about 20% of what the J6 committee knows, courtesy of more than a thousand witnesses. Because yes, Benny Thompson and Liz Cheney and Representative Raskin, all members of the J6 Select Committee, have been sharing with us some details of what those thousand plus witnesses have said. And remember, they have probably millions of documents, evidentiary, uh, little, little pieces of evidence at this point that they're learning from. But we know maybe 20% of it. We're going to learn a whole lot more beginning on June 9. And I take Representative Raskin at his word that it will blow the roof off the house. Now, how would you consider these hearings to be a success? Like what's the best case scenario for Thompson and Cheney and Raskin and Kinzinger and the rest of them when all is said and done? So I think success looks like a couple of things. One, it looks like legislation because that's really one of the primary purposes of the House Select Committee's investigation. They wanna legislate to protect us against this ever happening again. Um, Secondarily, uh, they are going to make, I'm convinced, a number of criminal referrals based on the evidence that the investigative team has put together. And it is an adept investigative team. The reason I believe, Brian, these hearings are going to be unlike anything we've ever seen is because the investigative team consists of a whole bunch of former federal prosecutors who are experts in RICO prosecutions, gang prosecutions, white collar pro prosecutions, and public corruption prosecutions. It's a powerful mix. And, and not only do they know how to investigate crime, they know how to present information to a jury. The jury in this case will be the American people. So that's what I think a success looks like. And I also think, look, pressure bursts pipes. And I think once we, the American people, see with our own eyes the evidence that they have amassed against Donald Trump and others for what they did to our democracy, DOJ will have no place to go but to indict them for their crimes. I want to move over to the Supreme Court for a moment. You know, we're seeing decisions being handed down one after the next on issues that really only appeal to like 30% of Americans. They're, they're likely going to gut the Clean Air Act. We've got Roe. Do you think that the Supreme Court needs to be expanded? Oh, it, it does. There's no question about it for lots of reasons. Um, notably, the population of the country and the caseload of the federal courts have expanded dramatically. So what do we see? Well, around the country, we see uh, federal judges being added to the federal bench to keep up with the, with the litigation caseload. It only makes sense to up the number of justices even before we get into ideology. 
right? We have 13 federal jurisdictions, but we only have nine justices. Each justice is responsible for certain supervisory duties, lar often largely administrative, but supervisory duties over the different federal circuits. Some of them have to do double duty and take two federal circuits because we don't have enough justices to cover the 13 federal jurisdictions. Plus, look, Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump soiled the federal bench, right? They crammed ju judges down the throats of the American people that had been rated, not qualified by the American Bar Association. That's a travesty. You know, if you look back to the Obama administration, every time the ABA weighed in, with respect to somebody that President Obama was considering nominating to the federal bench, if the ABA weighed in and said, Mr. President, they are not qualified, he never once nominated a not qualified candidate. That's the way America should work, divorced from politics or the ideology of any judicial nominee. You know, they soiled the federal bench so badly. And what we have now seen is a number of Supreme Court, a number of judges who aspired to be Supreme Court justices just flat out lied in their confirmation hearings, you know, virtually embracing the precedent of Roe v. Wade only to, you know, be so desperate to overturn it that the substance of their testimony was a lie. The question is, are we just going to let them all get away with that perjury, those false statements to Congress, or are we going to open a hearing into it and look into it? I suggest the latter is the appropriate course. Yeah, I, I think my, my biggest beef with this is at what point do we stop pretending that we have no other choice? Like the number nine is not sacrosanct. We've had more than nine before. We've had fewer than nine before. I think it's just a matter of how much we're willing to take here, but we are watching kids get slaughtered and you know in in their classrooms and yet we know full well that if there was any second amendment challenges the supreme court would strike them down we're watching uh, women be stripped of their bodily autonomy and we know if a federal ban on abortion were to be put in front of the supreme court that they would uphold it that if the opposite was put in front of the supreme court that if uh, you know um, protections for abortion they would strike it down so you know i guess the question is are we really going to pretend that we're helpless here just because it's customary to have nine justices six of whom are Federalist Society hacks, because, you know, because God forbid we we save countless lives and the planet, you know, because we wouldn't want to uh, upset longstanding tradition. I think that's my biggest beef with this, is that there is recourse, and, and we're, we're, so, we're so held back just by this idea that, like, the number nine is sacrosanct and that, that this is how it's always been, even though the right is, is completely content to gut any any tradition, any precedent that doesn't suit them, but we have to sit here and play by all of the rules that nobody else plays by. Yeah, nine is not a magical number. And Brian, I think you put your finger on an issue that I think can be applied across the board when it comes to norms, traditions, and customs. As you say, in our nation's history, we've had as many as 10 Supreme Court justices and as few as five. Nine is not magic. Um, so I think we have to reevaluate norms, traditions, and customs in our present day climate with, as you say, not only our children being slaughtered um, in mass shootings, but our black brothers and sisters being slaughtered, just trying to buy groceries. We've got our you know, LGBTQ brothers and sisters in the Pulse nightclub. We've got our Hispanic brothers and sisters just shopping at Walmart in El Paso. We've got our Jewish brothers and sisters at the Tree of Life Synagogue. We've got Asian American uh, brothers and sisters worshiping who are being, you know, this is insanity. It's pure insanity. And, you know, if if I were president, I, I can't even utter that. If I got to sign executive orders, I would sign 100 executive orders in 100 days until my right hand fell off. Then I'd learn how to sign them with my left hand. And I would attack. I would attack the proliferation and the unrestricted access to weapons of war in this country like nobody's business with executive orders. You have to be careful trying not to run afoul of the Constitution, but for gosh sakes, Donald Trump, one of his first executive orders was his hate-filled uh, uh, ban of human beings, yeah. Muslim ban. And the first one got struck down, but what happened? His nefarious administration went back, retooled, and got it right, or at least got it to pass constitutional muster the second time. Why can't we do the same thing in the gun arena to, to flood the zone with good, get out there and protect the American people with 
executive orders. Lord knows I put every restriction on high capacity magazines that I could think of. And then I'd fight in court and I'd say we're trying to protect the lives of the American people. That's why we're we're signing these executive orders and let the legal challenge come, because if we lose, then we retool. We learn based on what the judge ruled and we get it right the next time. But shouldn't we at least, Brian, shouldn't we at least put ourselves in a position where mass murderers have to reload as they're murdering and slaughtering our children? Let's go after the high capacity magazines at least. Let me just finish. I want to go back. And my blood pressure's up. I got to go back to norms and traditions because the other one that your question reminded me of is we have this quaint little norm and tradition that within 60 days of an election, the federal government, the Department of Justice, the FBI, tries not to take any overt law enforcement act that could interfere in the election or be perceived as being motivated by politics. Now, Jim Comey didn't follow that rule as an aside, but that is a quaint little Norman tradition that we need to move away from. Why? We have insurrectionists in Congress running for re-election. You do not give them an election holiday from investigating their crimes. Indict them on the eve of the election if the evidence is sufficient to do so. Don't let the insurrectionists get another foothold by being reelected because you've given them an election holiday based on a quaint little Norman tradition. Glenn, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Your insight is just beyond valuable. So I really appreciate you taking the time. My pleasure, Brian. Thanks. 